Well, Jossie, thank you so much for being on the program. And tell us a little bit about your early life in southern India, because uh, I've actually been to Kerala. It's a very beautiful part of India. Uh, tell us about the early life, what sort of family you were raised in. Thanks, Dan. It's a great joy and a privilege to be with you. And um, I was raised in southern India, what we, in a place, place called Kerala, which is known as God's own country. <laughs> um, but some people say it's uh, devil's own people. Oh. Um, but God is uh, gracious and redeeming his people there. I was raised in a Christian home. My yeah. family, we have historical um, evidences to say that we have been Christians in 1638. Ah, who, who brought the gospel there then? Uh, St. Thomas. Ah, um, uh, the, the he has data. brought the gospel more than you know 2,000 years ago. Yes. Um, our family has historical roots in the St. Thomas Church. Huh. Um, but unfortunately, uh, my father um, had a difficult illness, uh, mental illness. He was schizophrenic. Oh, boy. Um, so that made a very difficult childhood, and um, there was very little opportunities uh, for me at home and then God opened the door for me to go to Australia oh. when I was 17 years of age. Wow, how, uh, how did that happen then? Um, I met a, a business guy from Australia who was in um, printing and publishing uh-huh. and um, through that friendship developing um, he offered me an apprenticeship position in Australia to go and learn uh, printing. Wow, which which part of Australia? Uh, at that time, it was Western Australia, a city uh-huh. called Perth. Yes, and uh, we went there. And but God had different plans and purposes. I thought I was going to go there and make a lot of money and you know enjoy my life. Yeah. So uh, you, were you a Christian then or not? I was not walking with God. Oh, no. Okay. So you go all the way to Australia. Is that where you found the Lord then? Uh, yes. And uh, unfortunately, after arriving in Australia. Uh, three weeks afterwards, this brother that I went there, there with uh, went bankrupt. Oh, dear. That was um, a great start. <laughs> no. Um, so I had no money, no friends, and um, I ended up in the streets. Yes. And I lived in the streets for three months. Oh, how terrible. And became desperate, uh, became depressed and hopeless and wanted to commit suicide. Oh, dear me. And um, so at that point of literally I was on the on the top roof of a high-rise building wanting to jump down, huh. finish my life, um, that's where I encountered Jesus Christ. So what? What exactly? That's an amazing story. What happened? Um, because I was raised in a Christian background family, I knew about God, but yeah. I did not know him. Huh. Um, before I thought I'll just jump down and finish life, I thought, well, I'll just cry out, and if there is a God, he can help me. So I just lifted my voice and said, God, if you're out there, please help me. Huh. And something extraordinary happened. I um, fell down on the ground and was unconscious for I don't know how long, quite quite a long time. Yeah. Did somebody come along and find you then? N- no. I woke up, and when I woke up, um, I was totally changed. Huh. Uh, all the depression, the negative thoughts had, had gone. Yes. Um, inside, deep inside me, I had a, a, a sense saying that all is going to be well. Huh. Um, and um, incredibly from there I get up and come down and um, went to a particular place and knocked on the door and um, God opened that door and gave me a job um, that day itself. A family adopted me, received me into their home. Huh. Everything the, changed from we, that was moment. Was this a family you already knew? No, huh. no. That's the first time I met him. So uh, how on earth did you know them then? I mean, did you say uh, God directed you? Or? Um, somebody else said, because I've been searching for a job for three months. Yes. Couldn't yeah. find anything. And um, so I went to a friend and I said, look, do you know anybody who's able to give me a job? So huh. he gave me this address of a factory. I see. Okay. So that's where I went. Was it a printer's there? Or no, another it type was a cold work? storage business. Okay, dear man. So my first job was chipping the um, ice off the freezer <laughs> um, so from a tropical southern India <laughs> oh, um, to me. minus 24 blast freezer chipping uh, ice on the floor was uh, where I started. But God blessed us, um, continued to gave me favor with the with the owner of the business who yeah. adopted me as uh, his own son. I mean, physically adopted yeah, you? Um, or, yeah. Well, yeah, he did. I stayed with them. Yeah. They helped me financially. They gave me education, job, oh, everything that I needed. That is wonderful. Um, and uh, finally became one of the partners in the business. Huh. And um, God blessed the business abundantly. Um, it exploded and grew. And yeah. 
then I came to Victoria, Melbourne, yes. um, in the eastern part of Australia to um, grow the business. And um, again, the Lord blessed us, and we were able to list the business on the Australian Stock Exchange. And and my goal was to you know make as much money as possible, like yeah. most migrants, and enjoy <laughs> life. You know. Yeah. Uh, but I had no interest in India for uh, ten years. I never went back to India, not yeah. even once. Yeah. So, what was the turning point for you then? Um, I started to go out with um, an Australian girl mm-hmm. um, who came from a missionary uh, family background. Right. And um, when we started to talk about the engagement and I explained to her about my dream, uh, yeah. my target was by the time I was 30, I wanted to uh, retire, take the <laughs> money from the business and go and buy a hobby farm yeah. and uh, raise my family there. Huh. Um, so she was kind of very excited about all of that and yeah. um, but she wanted to see the taj mahal oh. and because you know she's going out with this indian and yeah. everybody asks oh so you've seen the taj mahal and <laughs> said no no but uh, we made a deal that we will um, spend our honeymoon or part of our honeymoon in northern india yes yeah so after we got married um, we went to see the taj mahal and from delhi to agra uh, on the train we met a little boy called Raju. Mm-hmm. And I've never been in northern India before. I had yeah. never seen the Taj Mahal. And uh, this little boy came, you know, cleaning the floor of the train and then oh. begging for some money. And we gave him some food and started to interact with him. And um, But I didn't speak Hindi in yeah. the northern Indian language. But incredibly, he spoke one of the South Indian language, huh. uh, which I happen to speak. Which is? Telugu. Okay. And um, so we were having a lot of fun just talking. Yeah. And for some, un- I don't know why, some unusual reason, I invited him to come with us for our honeymoon. <laughs> um, and some, un- again, uh, you know, unknown reason, he accepted our invitation. Yeah, right. And then I had to explain to my wife what yeah. was going on because she wasn't <laughs> understanding our conversation. Right, right. Um, so she was gracious enough to allow this um, slum boy <laughs> um, to join with us for our honeymoon. So yeah. for the next three weeks, we traveled all over North India yeah. with this slum boy. Huh. It's like the Slumdog Millionaire movie, yeah. <laughs> um, literally. What a great story! Um, and uh, he started to share about his world and yeah. you know the streets and and opened my my eyes to yeah. a world that I did not know that existed about huh. you know the sex trade, about yeah. body part sales and businesses, yeah, man. and how these children are being abused by yeah. gangsters and drugs and. Um, it, it it was um, incredible. So Slumdog Millionaire was pretty accurate then, from what you could see. From my perspective, that movie is an underdone movie. Rather underdone. Than, yeah, it is not overrated by any means. So things are even worse. Even and, worse. Yeah. Um, and and it is the probably something that most of our listeners don't capture is it's not just one boy yes. that is in that plight. There is 780 million people huh. um, that are in that or a similar That's plight terrible. in India. Huh. Would these be called the Dalits? They are the untouchables. Yes. The, yeah. So here you are on your honeymoon with this this boy as your guide, as it were, and God started to touch your heart to reach back to India. So when did you start Empart, and why did you call it that? Yeah, you know, uh, we're traveling all over India. This boy is now sleeping in Fashta Hotel, eating in fine restaurants. <laughs> you know, he's never, you know, all he knows is re- sleeping on the railway tracks <laughs> and eating out of the rubbish bins. Yeah. But he had a perspective in, on everything. Yes. Yeah. Know, anything that moved, he had a, he had a, a, an observation <laughs> and, um, and he was just kept talking and we were just listening and, when I went back to Australia, yeah. um, I started to uh, question my faith. Hmm. Um, I was in a crisis. You know, why am I here? Yeah. Why do I have what I have? And and I started to question, you know, my own background. Growing up in a home with a schizophrenic father who wanted to kill us. Yeah. My mother raised us. You know, in, in the nighttime would take us to the uh, you know, under the trees, oh. and we sleep under there all night because um, she didn't want our father to kill us. Yeah, um, but then here we are in Australia now. I'm blessed and have a lot of money. And, yeah. and, and I was confused. And, you know, why? Sure. Um, and for about three years, what I would say, I went through a faith crisis. Mm-hmm. Um, and during the time, I thought maybe the Bible is not true. It's, you know, God is, 
is Jesus is one way to God. Yeah. Um, because I wanted to live my life sure. uh, with my dreams. But then I was actually on a business trip to the U.S. in mm-hmm. Indiana. And while I was there, God spoke to me. Huh. And said, it was very clear that this is my word. And once that conviction came, I knew I had to adjust my life in 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 line with the word of God. Yeah. Um, and then I started to r- really read the the Bible again, as this is the word of God. And during that time came to a conviction um, that the only reason for me to exist as a Christian was to fulfill the Great Commission. Hmm. And um, so literally I called my wife from Indiana and I said, um, look, you know, we're going to do something very different. Mm. Um, and I explained to her over the phone and yeah. went back to Melbourne. Um, over the next 12, 18 months, we were able to transition from that. And um, so, okay, well, we do missions. Now, I thought missionaries were unfortunate white people. And being <laughs> an Indian, I thought I was exempted from missionary work. Um, but um, once I took ownership of that great commission, Yeah, I started to process and I started to apply for different mission agencies. Uh-huh. Uh, and unfortunately, I re- got rejected from every one of them. Oh, I'm a dear. reject from seven different mission agencies. <laughs> for what uh, reason did uh, they... Uh, different different reasons. Yeah. Um, you know, one of them, as strange as it may sound, said, uh, well, you're an Indian, unless you're willing to go to Africa or China, yeah. uh, you cannot be a missionary. Oh, uh, because I wanted to reach North India. Yes. Uh, yeah. Not because I was an Indian, because during that time I did some research and study, and according to Patrick Johnson, um, he says that North India has more people that have not heard the gospel than any other single country in the entire world. Huh. And he also states that North India will be the touchstone of Christian missionary success or failure. Yes, yeah. And so I, you know, uh, took on Paul's words. My dream is or my ambition is to preach Christ to those who never heard it before. Yeah, yeah. And said, I want to have a go at this North India. (laughs) And so when I went to these mission agencies, I said, look, I have a dream for North India. Yeah. And in North India, I didn't speak the language. I didn't know that, you know, it was a different culture and context. But yeah. Somehow the strange missionary thinking that you got to be in another country yeah. uh, was probably, you know, um, so they just said, uh, no, we can't let you be a missionary to India. you got to go to another country. So you finally felt, well, maybe God's prompted me to start my own ministry then. Well, again, we went through a crisis time and um, because, you know, you're, here you are very successful in business and you go to mission agencies yeah. and you get rejected. Yeah. You think, well, maybe, maybe God, you know, we made some mistake. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, um, some, then some friends came along and said, look, uh, you know, if God's challenging you, why don't you start your own? You know? <laughs> um, so we talked to some of our friends and, yes, yeah. and, um, started this ministry. Uh, we call it Empart because it's a made-up word from empowering and partnering. Uh, I see. Okay. Um, I, I wondered about that because usually it's Empart. So that's, that's great. Yeah. So it's E-M-P-A-R-T, um, yeah. Empart. So empowering and partnering. And when did you launch it? We started in 1998. Okay. Wow. Um, and so, so how did you start? You started in Australia first? We, we started in Australia just with a bunch of friends. And, and then you, you made your first trip to Northern India? We went to the North India. And where um, did you go in North India? We went um, all over North India, just traveling everywhere, praying, yeah. asking God for direction. Huh. Um, just describe that region because I, I'm always intrigued with groups like the Nagas. And uh, many of the people are not what I call Indian looking. They're more oriental. So tell us a little bit about that region. Yeah, North India is a, you know, India is a complex country. It's yeah. not one, you know, one people. It's, yeah. Uh, it's like Europe put together. Yeah. Um, so southern Indians are different. Southern India is largely Christianized, evangelized, like the Western countries. Sure. Um, eastern part of India, they are more like the Chinese people. Yeah. Um, and again, they are largely Christianized, evangelized. Yeah. Um, then North India, which is what we call the cow belt or the Hindi <laughs> belt, where <laughs> cows are protected. Oh, is that um, right? And it is yeah. against the law to eat uh, beef. Yes, yeah. And so most Americans will have a 
difficulty living there, I think. <laughs> but it's also the second largest Islamic country Is that right? so in, in the world, so huh. second to Indonesia. Wow. Um, so you've got Hinduism and Islam, and it's the birthplace of Buddhism. Buddha yes. is, many people think Buddha was Chinese, but he was North Indian. Huh. Um, so it's, it's the melting plot of religion wow. so this and is religious a really faith. Challenging place to start the ministry then, really. Well, absolutely, and persecution is huge. Um, Christian population in some of the regions are 0.05%. Yes, yeah. Um, so very challenging, very difficult. Um, we just kept praying and, and asking God for wisdom and strategy yeah. and favor, and then God gave us a vision um, to plant churches, uh-huh. which was that, you know, uh, again, I had this feeling that, uh, which I articulate in this way: If you want to brighten a beggar, yeah. if, if you want to brighten a person's day, give it to a beggar. Yeah. If you want to change a village, yeah. you, pl- you dig a well. Huh. But if you want to transform a nation, you plant a church. Huh. And and God's way to transform nations is through planting local yeah. churches and making disciples, which then able to meet the spiritual and social needs of the community. So it isn't you go in, you preach the gospel, they put their hands up, and then you move on to the next place. You've got somewhere where they can be taught. Then. Yeah, I think, you know, for many years we have tried that, and we know the results, um, it's not there. Yeah, yeah. You know, a, a million people come to Christ, but then what happens? Sure. Um, can, can you remember the very first church you planted? Oh, yes, absolutely. Very Tell clearly. us that story. Um, well, we went and, you know, with um, five of us, we started to pray. That's where we started the ministry. And these were Aussies, were they, uh, besides you? No. One was actually from Switzerland, oh. um, a backpacker. Uh, yeah. His name is Stefan, that I met in Australia. And he's sitting next to me here. Yeah, he is <laughs> in the studio with us. Yes, yeah. And then um, the the remaining um, three were Indians. Okay. And uh, we prayed, we fasted, um, you know. And I remember for the first seven days, we yeah. fasted and prayed for one person to be baptized. Huh. Um, and then after six months, we saw that miracle happen. That's wonderful. Um, and then God gave us a, a vision to uh, see 100,000 churches planted wow. across northern India. But coming back to your first one, who was the first pastor? Um, is a local pastor um, yeah. called Johnson. Okay. And so... Um, the, the church, what, what sort of building would they meet in? It was in his house. Oh, it was okay. just so a like one, a house church. It yeah. was just a one-bedroom house. Oh. We had no money to buy land or build a <laughs> building or anything. Um, you know, it, it was just probably uh, six feet wide by ten feet yeah. um, long. Um, that, that's where it, it began. Yeah, yeah. Now, how many, how many have you been able to plant so far? Well, um, in by God's grace, we have seen now uh, 4,200 churches established. Yeah, man. And along with that, there's another um, 3,000 churches that are in the pipeline of being planted, yeah. what we call the mission stations. So how do you train the pastors then? We, we have a unique way to train the workers. We don't have seminaries and other, other complicated programs. Mm-hmm. But our senior leaders adopts and takes on... Um, 20 to 25 young men into their home, yeah. into their families, and they live together ah. uh, for one year. Yes. Yeah. And um, during that time, the focus is on character development. I see. Because I believe most people don't um, fail in ministry because of lack of information. They yes. fail in ministry because of lack of character. Okay. So yeah. by living together, the leader is able to shape and mold the character of the person. Mm-hmm. Along with that, we have uh, you know biblical teaching, practicalities of church planting, yes. as well as we teach them practical skills. We teach them 17 practical skills skills like cutting hair, first aid, making candles and soaps <laughs> and and because when they are able to take these skills when yes. they go into a new community they are able to start programs yeah. that benefits the community straight away. That's great. And, and build relationships. So these churches are they all in northern India? Um, now we are reaching into Nepal, Tibet, yeah. Bhutan huh. uh, and the neighboring countries as yeah. well. Wow. Yeah. That's just astonishing. So now, here you are, you've got Impart, and I understand you've opened an office here in the U.S.? Um, for many years, you know, there's been many people inviting us to come to the U.S., and we yeah. felt, no, we didn't really need to come to the U.S., because yeah. 
um, God was providing our needs yeah. um, from India as well as from Australia. Um, but uh, four years ago, we started to see an, literally an explosion. It was like the fishermen that was fishing, not catching much fish. Yeah. Then they put the net on the other side. They were, <laughs> their boat was sinking. Their net was breaking. Yes. And uh, about four years ago, we started to literally begin that experience. You know, churches were exploding. People were coming to the Lord. Yeah. Entire villages, tribes, um, caste groups. And um, then I started to contact some of the friends here in America and said, yeah. look, we need your help. Yeah. Just like in that story of fishermen. When their net was breaking, their boat was sinking, they called out to their partners. They said, yeah. come and help us. <laughs> so here we are in the U.S., and um, some friends have got together, and uh, now we have established an office here in the USA. And uh, we are literally calling for partners to say, come, bring your boats, your nets, yeah. <laughs> um, it's because the harvest is truly plentiful. Yeah. Wow. Um, now, one of the strangest sights anyone can see in India is the snake charmers. <laughs> yes, and I understand you have a pretty extraordinary story about them. Yeah, um, a 17-year-old young boy who was a Hindu got saved, and within few weeks of that, he came into one of our training centers and got trained by one of our leaders. Mm -hmm. Then he felt God call him to go to Agra and oh. um, where the Taj Mahal is. Sure. And uh, one day while he was there, he saw the snake charmers, you know, <laughs> like most tourists would see. Sure. And he started to talk to them and build some friendship, and um, he started to reach out to them. And then he went into their community and found that almost all of them are illiterate. Yeah. They cannot read and write. Oh, their children okay. don't go to school. Yeah. Because within the caste structure, these people are outside the caste. Yes, They're not yeah. un even untouched. They don't exist. As far as the Indian legal They're not even human beings. They're not even human yeah. beings. They don't yeah. have identification. Yeah. They don't have voting rights. Huh. Because they don't have identification, they cannot send their kids to school. Yeah. So yeah. Th um, this guru, who is our church planter, who went there, he started to teach them literacy and numeracy and yeah. health and hygiene and started to build relationship with them. And God used that to um, bring his love to these people. Yeah. And um, slowly, one by one, started to come to the Lord. Yeah. And he was using the Bible as the, as the literacy teaching <laughs> tool. And um, amazingly, uh, four years ago, one entire village came to the Lord, huh. the whole community. And since then, 14 of the snake charming communities in and around Agra yeah. have all embraced Jesus Christ. <laughs> Are they still doing the snake charming? Or well, it, the, the amazing things, if you come to Agra now, on a Sunday you go to these villages, yeah. you see these people worshiping Jesus, <laughs> not in a church building like this, literally in the open fields. Oh, and they, the, the, the very instruments that were used to charm the snake yeah. are now being used to worship Jesus. Oh, how wonderful. And, <laughs> and uh, not only that, we have actually trained 18 of their people yeah. to become church planters to reach out <laughs> to other snake charming communities. That's great. And God has began an amazing work. Now we have yeah. set up a school um, for the children of the snake charming community. Yeah. We are teaching them. We are fighting with the government to get them recognized. Yeah. And um, it hasn't happened yet. We ask uh, your listeners to be praying for us. Yeah. Uh, because they don't know that they are created in the image and likeness of yeah. Jesus. That's a great story. So finally, Jossie, uh, tell us how people can get involved. Uh, maybe give the, uh, the USA phone number and website. You can visit mpartusa.org, which is E-M-P-A-R-T-U-S-A dot O-R-G, or call 888-863-6727. Come and visit us and uh, look forward to hearing from you. And finally, right at the beginning, we uh, introduce you to Mark Ellis of God Reports. What's the website that people can go and get more information from your ministry there? www.godreports.com I want to thank Mark Ellis and Jossie Shako for a, a rather amazing program. Thank you so much and God bless you. Thank God you, bless. Dan.